basically, before we can talk about surgery, we have to understand safety in terms of what causes hair to be lost. Who is a safe candidate? Who can you operate on? Who should you not? Men lose hair in certain patterns called the Norwood Hamilton scale. You must understand how hair is lost for you to recreate patterns that look natural. So study this, understand the Norwood hair loss pattern so that you don't create results that look unnatural. We'll talk in a moment in the next lecture more about technique. Again, first, the first lecture is outlining safety, especially if you're not a dermatologist, you don't understand hair loss as well. So you must understand who to operate on, who not to. Male pattern baldness is not that you have hair and then you don't have hair. You have thick terminal hairs in youth. And as you start to lose hair as a man, they start to become thin miniaturized hairs called vellus hairs, which you're seeing in the middle. Vellus hairs are thin, they're short, and they don't pr create much visual density. The next step is no hair. So this transition that goes from thick hairs to no hairs. Propecia, or finasteride, we'll talk about in a moment, helps to bring this equilibrium back in the direction of thick hairs. It takes thin hairs and becomes thick again. So remember this slide when we talk about Propecia, which is a medical management, in a moment. How does modern hair restoration work? I apologize if you already know this, but you need to know this slide. Donor dominance, back in the 1950s, Norman Orentreich, a dermatologist in New York, found that transplanting hairs that are genetically programmed not to be lost will not be lost when they're moved to the front of the head. So think of the baldest man you know, he still has a cuff of hair on the back unless he shaves it. That hair is safe hair. That hair moved to the front will not be lost. That is the concept that all modern hair restoration is based on. So, who is safe? We talked a moment ago about fat grafting and who is safe. Well, let's think about what happens as you get older with hair. You're, just gonna, you're either going to keep it or you're going to lose it, but you're not going to grow more hair. So for those that are in the process of losing hair, they continue to lose hair. They continue to have lo less and less hair. And there's therefore less and less usable supply, especially if you do more and more transplants. And there's increasing demand. There's increasing baldness. This is why ethically, if I can drive one thing home to you today, if you do not do hair restoration, is do not operate on a young man, especially under 30 years of age, if you don't know what you're doing. And even if you know what you're doing, you better know to be very careful. Because that person that looks so easy over time will have problems if he has a lot of expanding hair loss and less and less supply. So I want to drive home thinking, safety, and ethics in this talk before we talk about technique. We have to understand that. When I sat for the uh, board in hair restoration, the one thing I learned is how to be a safe surgeon. So important. That's the goal of this lecture. Increasing demand, decreasing supply is a no-win situation. You must know if you have enough supply to meet that demand in the future. Women lose hair. Is it a small percentage? No. 30% of women over 30 years of age lose some hair. And you must understand that this is a huge percentage of my practice and it potentially could be a huge percentage of your practice. And we're not going to get too much into this. That's a whole different level of education. I'm lecturing on that in St. Louis actually, but it's just too much. But you need to know that women lose hair. How do women lose hair? Well, let's just briefly understand it's completely different from men. There's three ways they have patterns of loss. One is they can have a male pattern loss. They can actually have frontal temporal recessions and it looks more like a male pattern loss. But 
it's still with estrogen changes, so it's not classically male. The most classic way that we talk about it is what's called the Ludwig classification, which is diffuse loss in the central area. And that's something you can grade from a one, two, and three. The third type of loss, which Elise Olson claims is the most common, is called a Christmas tree pattern. If you have a woman bend down and you part the hair in the middle, you'll see that it looks like a Christmas tree with the apex on the back. So the focus is restoring the central forelock or the front. Again, way too complicated. I just want to introduce how women lose hair and that is very prevalent. That's it. I can't tell you more about how to do it. That's for my hair course. It's just too much information in, in two hours. But you got to understand that if you do see a woman losing hair, you don't rush to the operating room to start putting hairs up there. They're going to shed like crazy. There's a whole different way of doing it surgically. But you need to understand that a male coming in with male pattern loss, I feel pretty comfortable they need a transplant. Okay, And I'm going to talk about medicine how to help them. But with women, you've got to make sure that it's not just basic hormones. You've got to rule out problems. Young women in their teenage, 20, 30 years old, if they're losing hair, it could be because of menstruation, because of low iron. Low iron is one of the most common reasons women have hair loss, young women. Postmenopausal or perimenopausal, even before, thyroid issues are always prevalent, but then hormones can start taking over. If you want a list of those hormones, I hate to say you can get my book on this, or I can send you a, an email with a list of things, but I'm always looking for estrogen, uh, I'm looking at thyroid, iron, uh, male hormones, dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate, D-H-E-A-S, which is the most common male hormone in a female. Um, another lecture I just heard last week that was shockingly amazing was on prolactin. Uh, if you have high prolactin levels, it can cause what's called chronic telogen effluvium, which is just chronic hair shedding. So really, before you touch a woman, make sure that you check her levels of all these iron, thyroid, hormones, things like that. And make sure, if before you do a transplant, she's on protection with minoxidil or at least an attempt to be on minoxidil before you rush to the operating room. And if you're going to do a female transplant, please have a good understanding of doing a lot of men because women is a totally different animal in terms of their type of hair loss and how to get good results. This slide is to remind me about safety. If you're not a dermatologist in this room, buy Jerry Shapiro's book, Hair Loss. It's a great book. It's an easy book. For me, I'm not a dermatologist, and I used it to study for my hair boards. It just tells you scarring alopecias, different types of things, lupus. If you see anything in that scalp that looks weird, do not cut on that patient. You, they may not have a good result. They may have spreading of their disease. They may not have any growth. Don't do it. Look for those scalp, look in the head, and make sure there's nothing going on with that. Trichotillomania, hair pulling. Look for problems before you operate. Again, this is for people that are not dermatologists.